So in this lecture, we are going to determine how much is the deformation in the axially loaded element. An axially loaded element is the element that is subjected to a force along its own axis. And a simple axially loaded element means the element that is subjected to a constant force, as shown here, F, and has a constant cross-section area. In order to determine the deformation, we are going to start with the definition of stress. We know that stress is simply force divided by the, the cross-section area. Then we are going to use the relationship between stress and strain, or Hooke's law. We know that stress is modulus of elasticity, E, multiplied by strain, epsilon. And I can solve that for epsilon. Epsilon is going to be sigma divided by E. Then I'm going to plug in the value of stress from the first equation into this equation. So strain in that simple axially loaded element would be force divided by Ea. The last equation that we need in order to determine the deformation would be the relationship between deformation and strain. Strain in this simple axially loaded element is going to be constant along its length. So in order to determine the deformation, I would simply multiply strain by the length. So delta is epsilon multiplied by L. I'm going to plug in the value of epsilon from the previous equation, and that would give us the deformation equation for axially loaded element. This equation is known as Flee equation, and that would simply give us the magnitude of deformation in a simple axially loaded element. And again, by that I mean an element that is that has a constant cross-section area, is subjected to a constant force, and we want to determine how much is the total deformation in the entire length of the element. Okay, this is not new. I just wanted to prove that for you here. Now, if we have a system of axially loaded element connected together, like the one that is shown here, we need to split that into simpler parts. Like in this case, I'm going to split that into three different segments, calculate the deformation in each of those segments, and then add them together in order to determine the total deformation in the system. Because in each of these segments, the, the cross-section area is constant and the force is constant. So it could be calculated by splitting that into simpler segments. But what if we have a section with variable cross-section area or variable loading, or like in this case, both section and loading are going to be different. I gave you the equation, but I didn't prove that. Here I'm going to prove that equation for you to see how can we derive the right equation in order to calculate deformation for this case. So consider a general axially loaded element with variable cross-section area and variable loading. This is the most general form of axially loaded element that we can imagine. So first of all, we know that we cannot use that flea equation here. Why? Because the cross-section area is not constant. That means that stress is variable along its length. Also, that means that strain is variable along its length. We cannot use those equations before because the assumptions are not valid. In order to solve this problem, I'm going to use one concept that we have previously learned in calculus, and that is integral. Integral, by definition, is the area under a graph. And in order to calculate the area, we can split that graph into small parts. And integral theory says that if we split that graph into very, very small parts and calculate the area for each of those parts and then add them together, that would give us the total area under the graph. If we split it into more smaller areas, we get more accurate answer from the integral. If we assume that those small particles are infinitely small, we can get the exact answer for the integral. In order to solve this problem, I'm going to use the same concept that we have learned in integral. I'm going to consider one tiny small part of that axially loaded element, which is shown here with the length of the uh, dx. In this case, if the length of that particle is small, we can assume that the cross-section area remains constant on the left and on the right. So the variation of the cross-section area is negligible. We can ignore that. Also, the variation in the internal force is small, so we can ignore that. In other words, the force acting on the right and on the left are equal to each other, and it means that the force remains constant along that small particle. If you want to determine the deformation, we can use that Flee equation that we previously developed, because in that small particle, Area is constant, force is constant, and if the material is homogeneous, the modulus of elasticity remains constant. So in this particle, we can calculate the deformation 
And I'm going to call that deformation as D delta. D stands for very small part, and delta stands for the deformation. In that tiny particle, stress is defined as PVS, force divided by area. In a similar way, there is a relationship between stress and strain. So stress is E multiplied by epsilon, and epsilon would be sigma over E, and I can plug sigma from the previous equation here. So strain in that small particle is a force divided by Ea. Now in order to determine deformation, here is going to be different from the previous part that we did. We are going to calculate deformation just in that small length, which is shown by dx. So I'm going to multiply strain by the length of that part, not the length of the entire element. The length of that part is shown by dx. This is going to give us the tiny deformation in that small particle. By the way, that deformation is going to be very small. I just exaggerated the deformation here in order to make it visible. Okay, how can I determine the total deformation in the entire length of the element? Here, we are going to use the concept of integral. Integral says... If you want to determine the total deformation along the length of the element, you simply add up these parts together. In other words, the total deformation is going to be integral of epsilon dx. And I'm going to plug in the value of epsilon from the previous equation, f divided by ea. That is the equation that we can get for deformation in general for axially loaded elements. I showed here force e and a as a function of x, because in this particular problem, uh, we just showed the element in the horizontal direction. But the variable could be y, or could be z, depending on the axis of interest that you're working with. I just here showed that we need to integrate that based on this variable, which is the coordinate. Yes. So for those who are on Zoom, the question is, do I give you the force equation so you can plug it into this equation and determine how much is the deformation? The answer is no. We need to determine that. That's actually the tricky part. That is where we need to use the concept of free body diagram in order to determine the internal force and use that in the integral equation. Before solving a problem, let me validate this equation. This integral form, I said, is valid for every shape. So it should be also valid for simple shape, right? So I'm going to calculate the deformation in case that A, E, and F are constant. In that case, these constants could be taken out of the integral. And that equation simplifies to F divided by E, A, integral of dx from 0 to L. Integral of dx from 0 to L is simply L, or the length of the element. So we get that three equation again, F, L divided by E, A. The integral form is a general deformation equation for every axially loaded element with every shape and loading. If the section is constant, it has a constant cross-section area and the force is constant, we use the simplified form simply because it is easier to work with that. All right, now let me look at one problem here. So in this problem, there is a rubber string which is supported on top. It is just hanging from that support under its own weight. The length of that string is given to be 400 millimeter, and the modulus of elasticity of that rubber is given to be 85 megapascal with the density of 12 kilonewton over cubic meter. We want to determine the maximum deflection in that string. Note that in this problem, there is no external force. It is just subjected to its own weight. Getting back to the question that you said, there is no given equation for the internal force, and we need to derive that. We need to see how much is that internal force. How do we determine the internal force in a system? We use the concept of free body diagram. I'm going to cut this rubber string at arbitrary point with distance of y from the bottom part and put a known force at the cut section, which I'm going to call that Fy. So this Fy is developed here to make this free body part in equilibrium. The other force that acts on the free body would be the weight of that part. The weight is going to be equal to the density of that string multiplied by its volume. Volume of a cylinder would be area, the circle, multiplied by its height, which is shown by y. Area is pi diameter squared over 4, and height of that is y. And then I'm going to plug that volume back into that forced equation. And then 
we have determined the force in terms of the variable y. Let's check one thing here. How much is the force at y equal to zero? In other words, how much is the force on the bottom part of the string? It is zero, because there is no weight if we cut that on the very bottom part. Where the internal force would be maximum? On the very top, because in that case, it needs to hold the entire weight of that string. And that weight is linearly increasing when we move from down all the way to up. Okay. So the equation seems valid. Now I need to plug that into the integral equation in order to determine the internal deformations. Deformation is F divided by E A. E and A in this problem are constants. There is no variation in the cross-section area or the modulus of elasticity. Force is calculated to be gamma multiplied by A multiplied by Y. A is going to cancel out in this fraction. And that simplifies to integral of gamma y divided by e. And that gives me the deformation at any point. The maximum deformation would happen when I integrate this for the entire length of the element. So the maximum deformation is simply the integral of the equation from 0 to L. OK, in this equation, gamma and e are constant. So I can take them out of the integral. And the integral is simply integral of y dA. That would be y squared divided by 2. And if we integrate that from 0 to L, that would be equal to L squared divided by 2. Now let me plug in the values into this equation. When I want to do that, I need to again make sure that units are consistent with each other. So I'm going to convert everything into millimeter and megapascal. The only parameter that I need to convert would be gamma which is given in kilonewton over meter cubed. And I need to convert that into newton over millimeter cubed. Uh, I need to multiply that by 1,000 and divide that by 10 to the 9th. And that simplifies to 10 to the negative 6. And I'm going to plug it in. And that gives me the magnitude of the formation in this element. OK. I know that when we want to solve these types of problems, there are many different parts involved. But we want to practice that and see how can we use that integral equation in order to calculate deformation in different elements. Now I'm going to give you a practical problem, which is common in engineering. A wooden pile is drilled into soil. This soil has two parts. On top of there is a clay soil, which applies a friction on the pile when it's drilled inside. And on the bottom part, there is a bedrock, which is rigid and firm. So once a force of P applies on top of that pile, part of that is transferred by the bedrock, and part of that is transferred by the friction that comes from the clay soil. So in this problem, I'm going to ask you to, to answer two parts. First, if the friction resistance on the pile is given, how much would be the force that comes from the bedrock on the bottom part? And in order to solve that, this pile should be in equilibrium. So we need to use the concept of free body diagram, right? So I'm going to take out this pile, show that external force P, the friction forces, which are shown in blue, and the reaction force that comes from the bedrock on the bottom. Some of these forces should be equal to zero. That's the first part. This part is pure statics. Now we get to the second part. How much is the total deformation in the wood pile from A to B? In other words, I want to see how much that pile would be compressed because of the forces acting on top of that. And in order to solve that, you need to follow the same process as I did in the previous problem. First, you need to determine how much is the internal force using the free body diagram. Here, I recommend you to consider y from top. So you're going to cut this section with distance of y and consider the top part as a free body. Determine how much is the internal force. The cross-section area is constant. Modulus of elasticity is constant. So those could be taken out of the integral. And once you take them out and determine internal force, integrate that from 0 to L in order to determine the deformation. 